Let us pray. Dear Lord, we believe that you're working it out. We believe it because you said it. And your word reminds us that you are not a man that you shall lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. If you say you're going to get it done, it will be so. And so, Father, re really, that's all we have to stand on is your word. You said heaven and earth shall pass away, but it's your word that shall remain. And so we're standing flat-footed with our heads up now. They were hung down this morning before the praise team came, before I logged on. I didn't know how it was going to work out, but I was reminded of your word that says that all things work together for my good. And so now I'm confident in you. Um, I know my relationships are a little shaky, but I'm confident in you. And so your word is a sure thing that we can stand on. And so as your word go forth with power today, I pray that we will have hearts to receive. I pray, God, that our ears will be open so that we can hear and that you will make our hands willing to work. Because, Father, in that working it out for my good, I know that you're able to do all things um, above all I can ask or think uh, exceedingly and abundantly. But, Father, you said it's the, according to the power that worketh in me. It's some things I haven't done for the situation to work out, God. Um, Father, you're going to do your part, but give me the willing spirit to do my part, God. That's to trust, to believe, to pray, to get up, and to walk, and to work. And so I pray, God, for everyone that's standing in your pulpit to preach, that you will give, your power will go forth, and that your people will affirm that your word is true. We bless you. We give you glory. We give you praise. And on this Memorial Day weekend, we pause to just reflect on it to those who literally gave everything up in service for this country. And Father, we are reminded that you literally gave everything up for your church. And so bless those families who, who are remembering without the family member being there. And bless your church as we remember and remember that you're always there with us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Come on, put your hands together. The praise team did a beautiful, beautiful job just reminding us of God's promises through lyrics. And so turn with me to Psalm 51. I'm going to read the entire psalm. It's a very familiar psalm, and I'm excited about what the Lord, how the Lord is going to encourage us today. And I just, I'm grateful. I'm always glad to be in the house. I give honor to our pastor and our first lady. I'm just always glad to be in the house of the Lord with the people of God. So it's some mean people out there. So when you can come in the people are in the house of the Lord with some smiling faces, it is always good. Psalms 51 verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me, a not, oh, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. 
Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. My text today is determined not to be dirty. Look at your day and say, I am determined not to be dirty. Amen. You may have your seat. Now, the key phrase in my title is to be. Um, being speaks to a position. It speaks to something you identify with. I'm not talking about being perfect today. So I hope you don't leave service feeling like you have to live a perfect life. But I do hope you inspire to let the Lord perfect you. Um, I hope you don't feel pressure from my message that you always have to do the right thing. But I do hope that you feel motivated to live a righteous life. I'm not talking about having moments of weakness or the everyday fight that we have with our flesh. But af after today, I do hope, Pastor Kyle, that you are committed to that daily fight to live out Proverbs 21, 24 and 16 that says a righteous man falls seven times, but he get up eight times and so I hope that after this message that you are committed to doing the work that that you need to do in order not to be dirty our text today is David's response to the prophet Nathan's rebuke of him for sleeping with Bathsheba getting her pregnant and killing her husband so he could take her on as his wife I know that's that's heavy that's that's a lot um that account is in second Samuel 12 um verses 1 through 12 and David responds with Psalm 51 and his response is one of remorse it's one of sorrow over his sin and it's an expressed desire to be clean in verse 2 he said wash me thoroughly he said clean and cleanse me from my sin in verse 7 he said purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow in verse 10 he said create in me what a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Um, um, I submit to you that being determined not to be dirty goes beyond not wanting to be dirty. It's a desire to be clean. Oh, 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 it, 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 there's a difference. Not wanting to be dirty looks like doing good for the sake of doing good. You're a decent person, but desiring cleanliness is being determined to walk in holiness and living a holy life. I'm determined not to be dirty speaks about our intentionality and living a life that's pleasing to God and representative of God. Hebrews 12 and 14, it tells us to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Don't get quiet on me now. No holy messages get people quiet. Don't get quiet on me now. Um, he's still working it out for your good, right? <laughs> um, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 says, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, Affecting holiness out of reverence for God. Like I said, it goes beyond just not wanting to be dirty, but you want to be clean. There's an obvious outline in the text that speaks to David's determination not to be dirty. I love it when the Lord just lay it out clearly for us, Pastor Keisha, um, and he tells us what he wants to be told. And the first thing that we see in David's determination not to be dirty is David's confession. Verse Verses 1 through 6 speaks to David's confession. And that confession is a little bit more than just admitting your sin. It's admitting your sin, but acknowledging the damage that your sin has done. And so a formal admission of one's sins, and it's desiring forgiveness to get beyond that point. The confession wasn't admittance of what he did wrong. Um, the prophet Nathan came to him, and he said, he told him what he did, and, and David knew exactly what he had done, but it came to a realization that of how what he had done had hurt God. I hope that we get beyond. Um, uh, uh, Audrey, I don't want to talk about you because it may hurt you when you find out, but I want to get a point that I don't want to talk about you because it's going to hurt God that I talk about his daughter and how I treat you. I want to get beyond loving my husband just because he's a good man. I want to get, I want to, get to a point of loving my husband because it will hurt God if I don't do so. 
David was acknowledging that, that this sin had done some damage to his relationship with God. Verse 4 says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. At that point, it wasn't about Nathan. It wasn't about Bathsheba. It was all about God. And I, and I think there's some things that we need to admit today. Um, I'm not saying tell everybody your business, but you need to go to God. And you need to say, I know I've done this um, in your sight and it was wrong. And, and I'm not only sorrowful for this thing, but I'm, I'm sorrowful to how it hurts you, God. The one who wakes me up every morning, I'm sorry for how it hurts you. The one who gives me my breath of life, I'm sorrowful for how it hurts you. You. The one who watches over me and protects me from the evil one. I'm sorrowful for how I hurt you. First John 9, 1 and 9, and he tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But David's determination didn't just um, talk about or, or didn't just point to his confession, but it also, this text talks about David's cleansing. In verse 7 through 11, 11, David goes through a process of asking the Lord to purge him, to clean him, to give him a new heart. Um, and cleansing, this cleansing was not referring to an outward cleansing. I'm sure that David was a bad, bad boy. He was the king of Israel. And he had all the fine garments. It wasn't talking about he had people to bathe him and people to, to, to um, cater to him. It wasn't talking about that. Um, it's not talking about putting on your Sunday's best and coming in to the Sunday's temple but still living a raggedy worldly life it's talking about an inward cleansing verse 7 when he said purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean hyssop was the plant um, that, that they use in ceremonial cleansings um, and if you read Exodus 12 you will see the Passover account and then and God told his people to dip a bushel of hyssop in the lamb's blood and mark the doorpost what that, hyss what that hyssop was doing what that mark was doing it was doing more than just letting the deaf angel know to pass over these homes. It was setting the children of Israel apart. Um, it was letting the people know that they're pure. It was letting the people know that they've been called by God. It was letting others know that they are the ones that God has set apart in order to do his work. I want to park right here and let you know that your cleansing is important because God needs some people who are pure. Some people who are set apart. Some people that say for God I live and for God I die. Some people that say I don't want the way of the world I want to do what the Lord has called me to do David's cleansing was an inward cleansing um, and he said purge me with his up um, actually that purge he was saying beat it out of me Lord uh, my, spirit, my flesh is weak beat it out of me Lord if you got to I remember back in the day um, um, the, um, the mothers of the church used to hold you down at the altar you ain't getting up until they feel like you're ready to get up and what they were saying was beat it out of my daughter Lord her shorts are getting a little short her mouth is getting a little mouth and beat it out of a God. Why? Because I want her to be a clean vessel. And so um, this cleansing is talking about an inward cleansing. You can't dress up sin. You can't serve sin away. Um, you can't come with enough Sundays for sin to leave you. You got to yield yourself and say, beat it out of me, Lord. Um, give me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Why? Because my desire is to please you. We have to yield our hearts to the Lord and allow him to cleanse us from the inside out. Come on, put that in your chat. Um, cleanse me from the inside out, Lord. Put it put it in. Cleanse me from the inside out, Lord. I don't want this thing no longer. I'm tired of crying about this relationship. I'm tired of Father wanting to do right, but sin is ever present around me. Cleanse me from the inside out, Lord. And then there was David's confession there was David's cleansing in verses 7 through 11. And then there was David's consecration. Um, David was, um, he was saying, he remembered that he was separate. Consecration is a separation from unclean things. Verses 12 through 19, um, David says stuff like, restore me the joy. Um, he says, I will teach transgressor your ways. What he was saying is, I will, but because you're cleansing me out, Lord, I will set myself apart to do the work that you've called me to do. Concentrate, consecration starts with the cleansing, but it is, 
it is to carry it out through an intentional process of separation. If you walk towards God, you are getting further away from the world, but you got to walk. <laughs> if you go towards God, you're getting further away from the world, but you got to go. And so that consecration talks about an intentional process of separation. I know you're probably saying, what, a, what about grace, Stephanie? And yes, grace is available. I told you I'm not beating us up for singing. I had to say, creating me a clean heart, Lord, this morning. I had to say, renew a right spirit within me this morning. But grace is available. It's not enough to live in grace, though, family. God wants us to grow in grace. You, you kind of you misuse grace if you just stay in the same position. If you're still cursing people out, what's the point of grace? If you're still talking about people, what's the point of grace? Grace is for us to grow towards God. And I know it's not easy, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not beating you up because dirt is attracted to cleanliness. Come on, you know, you've been to the family union, you got to wear all white, <laughs> and you're very intentional about keeping that thing clean. Uh, on first Sundays, and we were all white and on um, here at Word, and we got to get, you know, you get out the car a little different. You, 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 you don't change clothes until you get in the church house. It's because you're intentional because dirt is attracted to cleanliness. And I know that you're saying, well, you know, the Lord covers us, and he does. But we have to realize that we have an enemy. And he is always trying to steal God's glory. So if he, can t if he can tank your witness, if he can shut your mouth, if he can make people doubt God through you, then he is always going to attack you. Dirt is attracted to cleanliness. Um, I got a new vehicle. My husband is a great man. I love him. And it's white. And Tammy was teasing me. She said, I'm going to have to sign you up for my husband's. You're going to have to be a regular on his detail business. Why? Because you know that dirt is attracted to clean things and so that's why it's important that we have to be intentional that we have to consecrate ourselves and so what did David do in order to walk out consecration I want you to leave here better I want God I want you to leave here like the praise team saying I'm more of God and less of you the first thing that David did he accepted accountability God will send help to you to get you back on track because he wants us to walk the straight and narrow. Why? Because he knows that sin leads to death. And if you are wrong, you are just wrong. The problem is we have mixed correction with condemnation. That, that are two different things. Correction and condemnation are two different things. Correction says you were wrong and you need to get it together. Condemnation is you reminded me two months later that I was wrong after I've gotten it together. And so we need to understand that, that we need to kill that language that can't nobody judge me. And we need to kill that language that you can't tell me what to do. And we need to kill that language you put your pants on just like I put my pants on. Because accountability is a sure thing from the Lord to help us walk the straight and narrow. David accepted that accountability from the prophet Nathan and, and it was and when if we went over to 2 Samuel 12 please read that in your own time because it, I love the Bible it detailed what Psalms 150 was about I love it how God did that and, 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 and I'm going to summarize um, 2 Samuel for you verse 12 what it was is Nathan came up to David and he said David well, how would you feel if you had if there was a rich man in your in your land and he had all these sheep he had all these sheep but he didn't want to touch his sheep he wanted to touch the poor man who had only one sheep that he loved dearly he took that sheep he killed him and he had a nerve to, to use him to entertain his guests David said oh, he deserved to die Nathan said that's you David didn't say, that ain't me. I ain't got no sheep. I ain't killed nobody's sheep. And see, David didn't justify. He didn't make excuses. That ain't me. I ain't do that. I ain't mean that. What David said is, I'm creating me a clean heart, Lord. And renew a right spirit within me. David recognized that who he was because accountability offers a different perspective. 
accountability offers a different perspective. I know you didn't mean to hurt me, but you did. Can you think about, and maybe it was your tone. <laughs> Can you think about we were good until you put it on Facebook? Can you think about that it was all good until I heard you tell everybody in the choir about it? Um, accountability offers a different perspective. Nathan said, that's you. And we don't want to be accountable because we want to do what we want to do. But that is not the attitude that Christians should have. Why? It ain't because I'm trying to get in your business, baby. I got enough business of my own. It ain't because I'm worried about your marriage to the point because I got a marriage to worry about on my own. It's because I want us to all be who the Lord has called us to be. Because when he's exalted, he do things on the earth we can't even imagine. When we are clean that we didn't even ask for. That's why I want to hold you accountable. So he replies with remorse. You know, he didn't say, I'm king, you prophet. I'm about to put you to death for you come to try to check me. That's what we do. We love to throw our titles around and we love to hide behind our positions instead of accepting accountability. Accountability offers a different perspective, but accountability removes opinion and is based on God's word. You know if it's a true accountability, if it says, have you thought about Psalms 52 when it's saying you need to watch, and I, Psalms 52 don't say that, but you need to watch your skirt. <laughs> Psalms 52 don't say that, but I'm just giving an example. Have you thought about when the Lord says, be ye holy for I am holy? Have you thought about when the Bible says, watch your mouth and your words should edify? And it gives, it, it, it removes opinion and it's based on God's word. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. And in verse 9, he says, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? You know it's true accountability when they can give you the word of God. Because we all have opinions. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what my grandma said what opinion is, but um, it is something that it ain't good and it's not needed. Tell me what the Lord says. Accountability offers a different perspective. perspective. It removes opinion and it's based on God's word. But accountability comes through an ordained relationship. If you think about the people in your circle, God has already put safeguards. <laughs> when you start going to the left and to the right, God has already put safeguards in your circle that, that can give you accountability. It's up to you to receive those safeguards. The prophet Nathan was assigned to David. Actually, he was the prophet for David and for King Solomon in the time of David and King Solomon. But the problem is we don't view relationships as a tool for God to, for our relationship with him to stay intact. You know, we want to kiki with each other and go out to eat all the time and we want to kiki with each other. But Lord is saying relationships go beyond that. I put some people in your circle that, that can tell you, you need to get yourself together. Um, that ain't how a daughter of the king act. And, and, and that's very important because, and, and, and I, want to, I want to say this, you got to really have some license to be able to check me. You, like, if you don't know my story, <laughs> if you don't know where I'm coming from, then you coming to check me, I can reject it because I don't think you have the proper context. But you let Pastor Keisha call me and tell me, I saw your Facebook post, you need to take that down because that's not a woman of God. I will receive that because I know she got my best interest at heart. I know she ain't been talking about my post with everybody else, but she was coming straight to me. There's some people in your life that the Lord has assigned to you for accountability that, that because he wants your marriage to live. He wants your child to be the man and woman of God that he's called him to be he wants your ministry to live and so accountability comes through an ordained relationship think about that who in your circle has this assignment because y'all God is very intentional like we cool but God ordained our relationship from the very beginning because he already know where he's trying to take us all Right, he didn't. He our whole.
whole conversations don't have to be about hair and clothes and what's going on. God intended for us to help each other. So who in your circle can give you accountability? So David accepted accountability. And that's what we need to do when we are um, walking out consecration. But David did a second thing. He acknowledged the damage of sin. Sin separate us from God. In verse 11, he said, cast me, a not, cast me not away from your presence. And family, being with God is not just about when we get to heaven. We say that, oh, they've gone on to be with the Lord. They're, they're gone on to be. Being with God is an everyday reality for the believer. It's not a future occurrence. It's a right now. And the Lord desire us to live in such a way where we can be with him. And if you do not desire to be with God down here, you really don't want to go to heaven. You just don't want to go to hell. Because a desire with wanting to be with God is you don't want nothing to separate you. You don't want nothing to get in the way of you and God. You want to hear his voice in the morning and you want to feel his breath when you go to sleep at night. You want to be with God. But a lot of us walking around because we don't want to go to hell. I don't either. But going, not wanting to go to hell and wanting to be in heaven are two different things. Because you can have heaven every day, all day. When the Lord wakes you up at night with a song in your belly, that's heaven. When he wakes you in the morning and the sun is shining. And you know it was nobody but him, that's heaven. When he restores some things that you jacked up because he loves you, that is heaven. And we can have heaven every day. But sin separate us from God. Sin separates us from God, but sin also causes death. Romans 6 and 23 says the wages of sin is death. And I'm not just talking about spiritual death because David, like I said, he was already an appointed person of the Lord. He is already with the Lord. I'm talking about, so I'm not talking about spiritual death, but those who don't know Jesus as your personal savior, at the end of the service, we'll give you a chance to accept him because you do need to accept him so that the penalty of sin can be erased. But I'm talking about the way of sin is death. And I'm, so I'm not talking about just dying spiritually because we know that our salvation is not based on the works of us doing right things, but it's based on the work of Jesus' righteousness. But I'm talking about your dreams dying. I'm talking about sin. It, it weighs you down where you lose hope. You feel like you can't get it together. I'm talking about your relationships dying because when you sin and you talk about people, it hurts people and relationships relationships die. I'm talking about our ministries dying. When we don't want to acknowledge that sin separate us from God and we don't want to admit what we've done is wrong because sin hurt people. Your dreams, your hopes, your witness. You're on Facebook saying you are a child of God and then the next post you're cursing and you're telling people out off. It's not about you because I know we all, all are a work in progress. But it's about the other people who is seeing God through you. You're hurting them like, I thought she was. Maybe I don't need to go to that church. Maybe I don't need to tune in. Because if this is what, what I'm going to get, I'm going to be like, I'm trying to get away from this. And so, seeing her, I witness. But this is one thing, sin grieves the Holy Spirit. And just like relationships with each other are a resource to help us walk out this way of consecration, the Holy Spirit is also, he is a resource. David said, cast me, a not, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's my God. That's my compass. That's my comfort. He is the one that gives me, David talked about getting wisdom. Pastor Kyle talked about that wisdom in his prayer time. He is the one that we get wisdom, understanding. He tells us what God wants us to hear. And so as believers, it's important for us to walk out consecration because sin grieves the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that David did, he accepted accountability. David, he, was, he, he became aware of the damage of sin. 
But also David acted intentionally. Verse 15, he said, oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I will give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Pastor Gellia says this all the time. Sin will shut your mouth. But because sin, because you are, you are serious and intentional about getting beyond that, and to shake off condemnation that could come, you need to open your mouth and give God a praise. A praise for him setting a way for us to get on the other side of sin. But also think about this. When you are, when you are a regular praiser like I try to be, then it's hard to hurt someone that you done talk good things about all the time, right? So if I really talk about my husband all the time and I tell y'all how good he is and then you find out I cheated on him, he's going to be like, I thought he was all that. I thought he was good to you. I thought, and so when we lift up God, it's very hard to, to then wrong him. And so you need to be intentional about opening up your mouth to praise. I know you got a lot to praise God for because just like David, um, he should have been cast away. He should have been put to death. But the Lord said in, in 2 Samuel, Nathan told him, you're not going to die. Don't worry about it. And David did, went on to do some great things. We need to be intentional about opening up our mouth in praise. And also open up your mouth in declaring the word over your life. That comforts me. When I'm praying over my children, I say, the no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Open up your mouth and declare the word over your life. Open up your mouth. Be intentional to guard your heart. David said a contrite, a broken and contrite heart. That's a sorrowful heart. A heart that's broken over the things that breaks God's heart. And then work your hands. In verse 18, David said, do good to Zion and your good pleasure and build up the walls of Jerusalem. We know that David did not build the temple. Solomon went on to do that. But David had initially had the assignment, and he was ready to get to work because he said, when we build up the walls of Jerusalem, then you, can, you will accept these sacrifices. If you are grateful that God does not hold what you did over your head, but he gets you to the other side of that, then I can't, I can't understand why we have to beg people to serve. I can't understand why we got, to, we got to bring out snacks and we got to serve you food in order for you to come to serve. You should run up and like, David, Lord, what I need to do? Give me the hammer, let me build a wall. Uh, Pastor, you need somebody to help build a wall? Uh, help me build a bathroom. What can I do, Lord? Because I'm grateful. My daughter, I hope she doesn't mind me telling this story, and I'm coming to a close. McKinley runs, she is a phenomenal tennis player. I was telling, um, <laughs> she got her head down. I, I was telling Pastor that she won a, a tournament this weekend. When we showed up, it was all boys in her bracket, all young men. She was the only young lady, and she won the tournament. But yes, yes, we celebrate her. But McKinley came home one day, and she said, Mom, Dad, I signed up for cross country, right? Thinking that I've seen her on the tennis court, like mop people, with, you know, mop people up with, you know, on the tennis court. I go to the first cross country match. Kelly comes in almost next to last. So I'm like, <laughs> you come to practice every day, almost, and you come next, like you could, but she, this is the thing that got me. She ran off. Ma, I beat my time. Ma, I, I, I did some, I, I improved my time today. And so I'm thinking, I said, you, but you came in next to last. She said, oh, you think cross country is about cross country? Cross country is about tennis. It's about when I get on that court to do what I know I can do, that I have the stamina to, to hit the ball. I can move and I can, and so this is the thing. Um, I may not be able to quote all the Psalms like you can quote. I may not be able to preach a three-point sermon like you can preach, but you best believe I'm going to be in my word. You best believe I'm going to do my devotion. I may not be able to serve like you serve, and I may not be able to sing like you sing, but you best believe I'm going to open my mouth with praise. Why? Because it ain't about what you think. It ain't about what you think I should be doing. Oh, you got 
it twisted. It's about me pleasing my father. It's about me getting to heaven. It's about, and you got to look at the big picture. Yeah. Kelly said, you, th- you think cross country about cross country? And sure enough, she went on that court line on the, yesterday and beat up boys. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to um, diminish those young men at all because they play. What I'm trying to do is tell you that when the world say you can't do something, and when, when it looks like the odds are against you, when it looks like it's set up for you to fail, the Lord said, if you come to me with a clean and contrite heart, if you come to me wanting to do what I've called you to do, I will make your enemies your footstool. I'm I will make that will shut them like the lying mouth of the enemy and I will make you into what I want you to be and so why this message it's because when we return to full worship we want to return the right way we want every member growing giving serving and thriving but our desire is for you to do it with a clean heart because dirt damages dirt is contagious if you're on the media team, awesome. But if you're the one that's always complaining, or if you're the one that, that be talking about everybody that come on the screen, then we would rather you stay at home because you're just creating more of a mess. We want you to be a greeter, don't we, Yolanda? Come on in. But if you're the one that, that be, be throwing um, lap costs at people, if you're the one that snatched stuff out people hand, we, we would rather you just stay at home for a little while until you get your heart clean. We want you to serve, but more importantly, we want God to be pleased with you. God rains down blessings on those who are intentional about walking in his way. I love it when I go back to 2 Samuel 12 and I read the full account. You will see that unfortunately the baby that Bathsheba was was pregnant with, that baby died. Because God is true to who he said he has to judge sin. But I can imagine that after this, after this Psalm 150, the Lord heard David's heart and he knew he wanted to go in a different, a different direction. And he was sorrowful. And David lay with Bathsheba and she became pregnant. And then she, she um, birthed King Solomon. Solomon, the author of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Solomon, the wisest man ever to live apart from Jesus. And Jesus excelled his wisdom in Matthew 12. Solomon, the builder of the first temple, he picked up right where his father left off. Solomon, the last king of the United Nations of Israel before they split. What I'm trying to say is that something great came out of David's determination to be clean. The Lord is saying, I ain't expect you to do everything perfect, but if you yield yourself to me, I'm going to do some things to wow you. I'm praying for three groups of people. I'm praying for those for salvation. Living a clean life means connecting with Jesus Christ. John 3.16 said, for God so loved the world. That means he loves communing with us. He, 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 he wants nothing separ- to separate us from him. He gave his only begotten son. And then I'm praying for those for consecration. Like I'm talking about being set apart for real, for real. Like not just on Sunday, but that's the life you live and you're okay with it. (laughs) Yesterday, um, Trishonda had her Unleashed conference. It was really great. And Minister Alcina was speaking and she she was speaking about spiritual cockeyedness. I was like, what? She was like, it's when you have one eye on the world and one eye on, (laughs) on God. Right? That's spiritual cockiness. And the Lord wants us to get our vision straight so that we can look up to the Lord. When you look to the Lord, that's where your help comes from. That's where your, your power comes from. That's where your comfort comes from. And then I am praying for those for dedication. Just having a dedicated will to God, to doing the things of God. I know it's not easy. I have on a white blazer, but that don't mean anything. You know, just because you wear white don't mean you holy. It is about the intentional, intentional work that we put in. And so on the screen, they have a link. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, If you want to join our church where there is accountability through the word of God, 
but also through accountability through our structure. We have small groups set up just so that you have a few people in your life that can help you walk this out. We have accountability and counseling where if husband and wives are not seeing eye to eye, you can come and it's a party that's not biased. They don't have to go home with you, don't have to pay none of your bills, and they can hold you accountable for what the Lord has to say about how to live a married life. If you want to join our church, click membership. If you want to be a partner, or you just want a covering, you're not, you're not, you, you have another church that the Lord has called you to, but you, you appreciate and the covering through our structure that you may want to connect with. You can be a partner. Click on that link. And then if you need prayer, put your prayer request in. Ministers cover those every Sunday. And if you put down that you want us to call you, we will do so. We're praying for consecration. And so get in your mind, what are some things that you want to break away from? What, like, if you're addicted to something and you're like, Lord, I, I, every night I try, but it's just I find myself falling to this thing that I know is not pleasing to you. I'm grateful that your heart still breaks over that. That's a good sign that it doesn't have a hold on you. What about if you're remorseful because you said something to or about somebody and it tainted your relationship? Think about that. Get that in your mind. And then what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? Are you willing to yield your will to the Lord? Are you willing to be involved in the things that we have in place? You heard that SOAR comes on Saturday morning and they're gonna walk around at 7 a.m. We also have morning glory prayer at 7 a.m. So I'm gonna talk to Denise Dunn and say, everybody who shows up, because prayer is virtual, log in and we're gonna, we're gonna listen to prayer while we walk. Because we want to be intentional about doing things. And so let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you've made a way for us to be close to you. Because the truth of the matter is that's the only thing that really matters. We don't want your spirit to separate. We don't want to be separated from your spirit. Because we know you're intentional about the Holy Spirit being the comforter that we need while we try to maneuver these murky waters of the world. He's the one that gives us wisdom and understanding to provide clarity, to give us insight of heaven and to encourage our heart. So I thank you that you're receiving those who are saying yes to you, that they want to accept you as their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, I pray for consecration. I pray for those of us who've already said yes, that we will be serious about setting ourselves apart. You said in 1 Peter 2 and 9 that we are supposed to be a peculiar nation. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be building while everything else is closing down. We're supposed to be joyful while everybody else is worried and sad. And so help us to consecrate ourselves where we get to a point that is no longer about what we want or what the world says we should have, but what you want for us. And then get, make our, our hearts and our hands willing. Paul said it best, I, must, I want to do right, but evil is ever present, always around. Give them what they need, resources from heaven, accountability partners, the structure of the church they will commit to and connect to so that we can work out our salvation through consecration, God, of not wanting to be separated from you. And I'm excited about all of the testimonies of, I know a little more now, all of the testimonies of, I'm serving in a ministry, all of the testimonies of, I'm hearing God so clear now, my relationship has been restored because we are determined not to be dirty. And so bless your people, God. 
Continue to bless Word Tabernacle Church that we can be an entity to help people with cleanliness. We're a spiritual car wash. They drive in, God, and Father, you wash us with this word, and we go out sparkling clean for the world to see what you're doing. And so we bless you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Put your hands together if you're determined not to be dirty. Amen, amen. Praise. 